I'm going to give everybody a chance to sit down. It's really great to see a full house. Thank you all for coming early on time. We're going to try to get you in and out on time as well. My name is Bernadette Beekman, and I'm a vice president and senior counsel at York Yorkson Legal. And um, this is the second year that we've done this. You know, they say there's no I in team, but there is an I, an idea. And so last year, Michelle Coleman Mays and Kara Basinger wrote a book called Courageous Counsel, and we had our first event like this. So um, we have 15 books, which are over there in the corner. So 15 people in the audience are sitting down on a chair with a purple ribbon. And if you can find that, you can go over, take your ribbon off, and collect it there in the back. Okay? It's kind of like Oprah. I have extra ribbon if you need some. <laughs> it's called helping each other. <laughs> but anyway, it's kind of the Oprah effect. So you'll have to look. <laughs> and uh, don't worry, you have until the end of the program to go collect your book. <laughs> okay? And if you see a chair that is not occupied that has a purple ribbon on it, just go sit down. <laughs> Okay, so uh, that's about all I'm going to say, except that um, there are some members of our Committee on Women in the Profession here tonight. Can you all stand? Because really, there is no I in team. It's Judy Archer, Angela Rello is downstairs, Salila Yone, Allison Levine. We have several of our members here, and I just want to say that it's really a privilege to work on this committee because this is the programming that we do. And if you're not a member of the City Bar, Zakia will tell you about it. So without further ado, look for your ribbons, and I present Zakia Salim Williams. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bernadette. I'm so thrilled at the turnout. I mean, we're, my, again, my name is Zakia Celine Williams, and I'm the Chief Diversity Officer at Gibson Dunn. I actually previously worked here um, as the Director of Diversity, so this really feels like a homecoming to me, and um, the City Bar is near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm actually, I won the Diversity Champion Award alongside Liz Moore, who was the first Diversity Champion Award winner, Andre Shapiro as well. And, you know, before talking about the panel, I really feel strongly, um, I don't know how many of you are involved in the City Bar, but this truly is a wonderful institution, and I look at it as my second professional home away from home, and really hope that you will get involved and get engaged and, and feel the same way about, about this institution. Um, I am so thrilled and honored to be sitting alongside um, these wonderful leaders on a panel um, who lead impressive legal departments. In fact, one of them, um, Sandra Leung's, uh, Sandra Leung's um, Bristol Myers Squibb was named one of the best um, legal departments of 2013 by corporate counsel. Was it today? Not today it came out. Yeah. Today it came out, so yeah. Um, we're, we're thrilled at the response and truly grateful for, again, the City Bar, but the Women in the Profession Committee for their dedication to um, diversity and the advancement of women. I am not going to read bios. I will point out, I think you can see the name tags, um, titles, but Sandra Leung, who's um, the general counsel of Bristol Myers Squibb, Elizabeth Moore, Le or Sandy, I should say Sandy Leung, if you have a question, call her Sandy. Uh, Liz Moore, um, the general counsel of Con Edison. Lauren Goldberg, the general counsel of Revlon. And I'm going to get this right. Patrina Scar, I, I, I actually, Scar, uh, Scarlino. Uh, good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who is the general counsel of the Institute for International Education. So I don't know how many of you were Fulbright scholars or if you were in college, you remember those international study abroad programs. They do that in addition to so many great works, um, so much great work in terms of uh, getting more people interested in global education. And last but not least, Andra Shapiro, who is the general counsel um, of MTV Networks. So we are going to um, jump right into this. Uh, we hope in talking about leadership to impart to all of you um, the tools needed to lead effectively, the um, skills needed to overcome challenges or obstacles on your path to leadership, and really, I don't think that anyone will, anyone on the panel will say that there is a formula for leadership, but we really do hope to leave you with, um, you know, 
and talking with all of these women leave you with sort of what's needed to lead, which is, I think, for all of them, their values, their skill set, their knowledge. Um, so hopefully, in this panel, you will be richer for hearing from their experiences and their lessons. So let's jump right into it. And we'll start with you, um, Sandra. Um, or in the Sandy. whole panel. Was there any, Sandy, um, was there any, uh, and, and you can, if it was an aha moment when you were young, personal, or in your legal career, um, was there any defining moment in your life that you realized that leadership was a part of your life trajectory? And if it wasn't an aha moment, was there any pivotal moments where you felt like you gained critical leadership skills that continue to serve you? Yeah, I, I would um, say that for me, um, in the early 2000s, our company, Bristol Myers Squibb, faced a number of corporate crises after another. Uh, we had um, under investi government investigations for channel stuffing, inventory uh, issues uh, that led to a, a criminal investigation potentially by the U.S. Attorney's Office. So it was just one thing after another in the company. I was the corporate secretary at that time. but. There was, um, I, I learned very quickly that in times of crisis, you should run to the crisis if you think you can help. They're, they say there's no point in wasting a good crisis. And so if you think you can help, run to the crisis. And I learned during that, and I have to say it was one of the most angst-ridden periods of my professional life. We were fighting with the auditors. We were at outside counsel over. We had the government then on, on, on our case. And it was just a very difficult time. There was management. We had, we had made management changes. The CFO was fired. Uh, the head of our pharmaceuticals division was fired. And you just didn't know what was going on. And so at that time, it, I had to really help, the, I really wanted to help our board and our senior management through the, the senior management that stayed uh, through that crisis. And I learned very quickly, it was very important to separate the noise from the facts. And I think what guided me through that period was having a very clear sense of integrity and ethics and what was important. And I had to deliver some tough messages to senior management that they didn't necessarily want to hear. I delivered some <coughs> tough messages to my then boss, the general counsel. Um, because I was the attorney on the ground that was working on, on, on these issues. And so I think that cri working through that crisis situation it allowed the board of directors to see what I brought to the table in a crisis type situation and eventually that helped the board get comfortable with appointing me general counsel a couple of years later. So I think that was the pivotal, pivotal moment. We had two financial restatements in a year and that was, and this is before other companies had, had issues. So. It was a, a, a tough time, but again, a no point of wasting a good crisis. Was there people that ran away from the crisis? Did you see Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Absolutely. There were people who ran through the crisis, and that's when people really show what you bring to the table. In a time of crisis, you either help out or you duck. And the people who people remember the people who duck, and they remember the people who really helped out. And so I thought that was, um, you know, some people didn't survive in the company because they ran away from the crisis. Liz? I think I think I completely agree with you. It, you know, being there when the crisis is occurring and working with the team to assist is was I guess my path as well. Um, I after, after three years out of law school, I wound up in Albany, New York, working as an assistant counsel to Governor Kerry, and then I became an assistant counsel to Governor Cuomo. I stayed in Albany for 14 years, and as you can imagine, when you're working for governors. Um, there are lots of crises, everything from the, uh, a bridge on the New York State Thruway falling into the Skahari River with six cars going down, and you can imagine all of the issues around that to the uh, 1993 uh, World Trade Center. Uh, the, uh, the first time the World Trade Center, the governor's office was in, that, in the World Trade Center at the time and dealing with the, the legal challenges uh, you know, around that. Um, to the contentious uh, issues uh, involving legislative negotiations, my first uh, act as a team leader, I guess you could say, was I was responsible for uh, Governor Kerry's 2,400 vetoes of legislation on the basis that they were unconstitutional. So we, these were the days before we had word processors, before we had, we were, you know, we were using IBM Selectrics to, <laughs> to produce all of that. You know, I had a team of lawyers, I had a team of, uh, of administrative assistants, clerical people, and we had to do it in 24 hours. Um, so all of those kinds of, and I can, you know, I can go on and on and on about crises after, you know, oh, my favorite one, the chief judge, Saul Walkler. You remember that? Oh, yes. 
-hmm. you know, for, for 24 hours. We did not know who the chief judge of the state of New York was, and um, we also didn't know what would happen to all the decisions that he had, he had made um, during that period. So there were lots of different kinds of things throughout the career, and I think um, what really sort of hardened me, you know, at Con Edison we talk about storm hardening, but I think when you talk about Liz hardening, it was really um, working through all of those things and realizing that, you know, I couldn't do it all myself, but I had to figure out who could do it, where the talent was, who was best suited for particular positions, and, and give, them, give them the room to get it done. So for some of us who are not from New York, Saul Wachler. Can Saul you Wachler was the uh, chief judge <laughs> of the state of New York, and I won't go into all the details, but um, he wound up being arrested. There was a voice uh, a, scrambler involved, right? Huh? Disguise a voice on a. Phone. You you can yes, but 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 so sat <laughs> on a Saturday on a Sunday afternoon, I got a call saying that the chief judge of the state of New York had been arrested. I called the governor and um, I said, uh, you know, told him what happened, and um, as I said, for a period of time, hmm? um, we had a bit of a problem. <laughs> so you can you can Google that. There seems like that was a juicy story. So we'll we'll get to the we'll get to the bottom of it, Lauren. Um, I guess mine is not really, not an aha moment, and it certainly doesn't have to do with the crisis, so not quite as exciting, but I think the closest to a, a moment in time where I sort of realized that maybe that was something that was a, I don't want to say talent, but um, was probably my first trial at the U.S. Attorney's Office. I was a junior prosecutor. I'd only been there a couple months. Um, and it was a sort of different, difficult case, as a lot of trials are, as any trial is. But it was, you know, it was sort of the joke that, you know, don't worry, nobody can win this case, so you'll lose it, and it'll be great first trial. And it was this elderly man in a wheelchair, and he, everyone felt sorry for him, and it was a false statement case. He had lied on his application. All he wanted to do was become a U.S. citizen. And I tried this case, and he had lied about whether or not he'd ever been convicted of a crime. And I was, of course, convinced that he had, and I was very passionate about it. And I still remember the feeling of my, you know, the fear of the, for your first trial, but standing up in front of the jury and passionately arguing why this man should be convicted. Um, and then five minutes later, they delivered a guilty verdict. And there was this moment where I thought to myself, okay, if you're passionate about something and you frame your argument the right way and you frame your position the right way, you can get people to do what you want them to do. Um, and, <laughs> and it was just a moment in my life where I thought, okay, you know, people will act, people who I'd never met, never spoken to, people will listen to me and they'll listen to what I say. And that was a revelation for me that any, you know, 12 strangers would listen to what I said. But it was the right thing. It you was. Can do, right. You can use that, that right. talent for evil too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. So um, I, I, sometimes I think I've just been incredibly lucky because I haven't given a lot of this a whole lot of thought along the way. It's not like I've sat and thought about leadership or what moments or how to get from here to there. I've just basically tried to do the things I felt passionate about and really enjoyed doing. Um, and in terms of uh, now when I'm thinking back, when you, I'm thinking about taking on sort of what they call leadership positions, I agree with uh, my colleagues on the other end, although not so much in a crisis situation, but just when there were things needed to be done, you know, there are, oh, there are voids that need to be filled in many places. And if you're there to fill the void, and that could lead to opportunities. And for me, I wasn't sitting there sort of thinking, well, there's a void to be filled, so I'm gonna jump in there because that's gonna get me. I just really was lucky to work in places where I believed in the mission, believed in the work. I found it interesting. And so I was able to raise my hand and do things. And the more you do and you work hard at and you you know, are successful at it, whatever that may mean, the more you're sort of asked to do. And um, and, and that's just, uh, you know, so I, it's no aha moment, just um, I consider, you know, luck and, uh, and a lot of hard work. Andra? Uh, I sort of, I guess, fell into leadership. Um, I certainly wasn't hired as a leader. Um, I was 29 years old when I started at MTV Networks in 1988. You can do the math. 
Um, and cable TV was basically just an experiment. I don't think anybody knew whether it would survive, let alone thrive. Um, my first boss there was not a very um, strong or decisive leader, but she was very nurturing and supportive. And um, I think I, we just kind of made it up as we went along. Um, a lot of my team is here today, and I think they know what I mean. Um, and I think what my boss at the time did teach me was kind of a do unto others mentality, which is like manage the way you want to be managed, lead the way you want to be led. And organically, we went from one person in the department, me, to a department of 50. Um, and we just pieced it all together, and um, it seemed to work. And we do a lot of it, um, a lot of leading as a team, quite honestly. Uh, and, and it all seemed to work out well somehow, magically. Sure. So it sounds you're talking about sort of leading and coming into leadership and it kind of happening organically. Once you are a leader, um, do you spend a lot of time t thinking about how you lead and your leadership style? And, you know, if you read the corner office in the New York Times and you're, you're, what you are always struck with is how much the leaders spend thinking about how they lead and thinking about their leadership style and thinking about how they are perceived as a leader and thinking about, you know, sort of what message they're conveying. Do you spend time thinking about that? And can you talk a little bit about your leadership style? And start with me? Yeah, let's yeah. start with you. Um, we, yes, I spend an awful lot of time talking about leadership, partly because I think it's, it's really interwoven in our uh, in the fabric of our company um, i do read the corner office religiously i encourage everyone to do that it's actually now a book um, with the compilation of the columns um, for those of you who don't know it it's in the um, sunday new york times business section it's terrific um, but we just spent, I do spend a lot of time thinking about it. Um, I also um, had, the, had the great fortune that several years ago, our parent company, Viacom, decided um, that co-leadership would, um, would be something that they added kind of to our plate. Um, and I've had the fortune of um, co-leading with um, a couple of male colleagues now who are intuitive and respectful and sensitive, and that's provided um, a, a lot of new opportunities, some challenges. Um, and I think that being the female part of that equation means that sometimes I really have to force myself to um, own things and not always be deferential and kind of act like the wife uh, or the number two um, and to really kind of keep my hand raised as, as Cheryl Sandbrook says in her book. Um, and um, and uh, along with that, I still do all the party planning and I still buy all the official gifts and, and establish the dress <laughs> code and, and I love doing that so it's okay but it's a, it's a new and different challenge. Um, Sandra, can you discuss um, this? I know that we talked about you and how yeah. you're also one that I, constantly thinks Yeah, about I, I think I'm my harshest critic. And so I, you know, when you get to a certain level in an organization, everything you say gets magnified and subject to misinterpretation. So you have to think, and I've learned this by trial and error. I've made a lot of mistakes in leadership, and I've said things, and people interpreted what I said to mean something I didn't intend it to mean. And I said, oh, I can't believe that. So I, I think a lot about my leadership style. And my leadership style, I would say, is first I'm very transparent. Um, and, and, and the other thing that I really value in my law department is that no silos. Our law department is, um, we have about 115 attorneys now. That's 30% fewer than we, than we, than we um, used to have. We were 30% larger now, a few years ago. But we have about 115 attorneys, and I grew up in our law department, so I was very familiar with the fiefdoms, the infighting, and you know, knowledge was, control was power. The more people you had, the more power you had. And it was very dysfunctional. And when, so when I became general counsel, I said, you know, our success depends on our ability to work well with one another. There's not going to be any infighting. If you have something, um, if you have things to share with your colleagues, you share it in the room, not outside. You don't talk bad about the department outside the department. So that's a value that I really uh, place in that. And the other thing on my leadership style is I, I really don't like it when people treat other people with disrespect. You have to treat people with dignity and respect at all times. I, I have no patience for an attorney who takes out his or her bad day on their administrative assistant or, or, or the, the, guy, the guy or gal who works in the mailroom. And there was a time when that was not uncommon, that you'd had attorneys with a bad reputation uh, and mistreating people. And that's something that I, I just can't tolerate. So it's openness, it's collaboration, it's transparency. You know, those are the things that I really value. And I, 
I actually blog uh, and, and at the company, which is, goes against my grain as an attorney, especially as a former re re uh, recovering litigator to put things in writing. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think that communication <coughs> with the team is important, particularly because we have many attorneys outside of the US. And a way for, to make people feel connected is through our SharePoint site where we have you know, videos, I have my blog, and, it's, and, and all of that. And, and so that's part of my leadership style, too. I, want, I wanted to create a really diverse and inclusive environment where people really believe they could, um, they could work to their full potential, contribute them much, as much as they can. And was it difficult when you became general counsel and you had people who were more senior and you came in and, and you were more senior? Yes, I was not the most senior person in the law department when I received a call late one evening after the general counsel and the CEO were asked to, to be asked to resign. And I was corporate secretary at that time. I got a call late at night uh, from um, one of our directors asking me to be our, the interim general counsel. And I was not the most senior person. Again, I think the board knew who I was and they figured it was an interim assignment so it was safe to have me do it. But it was very difficult initially with my team because there were people very senior to me um, who didn't think that I deserved to be awarded this coveted position of interim general counsel. So overnight, people that were senior to me suddenly I, they reported to me. And I learned very quickly um, that if you can't change the people, change the people. And um, Oh, wow. And, and Say so, that one more time. <laughs> if you can't change the people, change the people and so it wow. be, be, because that sort of you became very clear which people were not going to support my vision for the law department who weren't going to support me personally and that negativity is infectious and it undermines your leadership when you tolerate people on your team for an extended period of time who don't support you and don't support your vision so we had to make a lot of changes and it was tough and i think managing people is one of the toughest things that i do and something that i have hopefully gotten better at, but I've made a lot of mistakes and I tolerated uh, behaviors that I should have not tolerated as long as I did. But you, you, you make these mistakes and you, you learn fairly quickly. So, but it was important to get a team that I knew supported and shared my vision of what a law department um, should be. Liz? Well, I came in um, from the outside. I've been at Con Edison for four years. Um, most of the folks in the law department have, were there significantly longer than I was. Um, the, uh, the, the Con Edison law department is a family. They've, they've worked together for many, many years, and they've dealt with a lot of emergencies and crises. So they really, there's a lot of trust. There's a lot of bonding. So this outsider comes in, and, um, and I had to figure out how best to you know, win trust um, be open and transparent. And we did a couple of things. Um, the company, uh, the corporate leadership team, and I did it in the law department, we did a lot of assessments, self-assessments. So I actually had my, uh, my group, um, you know, we did a retreat, and we did, went through a number of different kinds of instrument, instruments, whether it was Myers-Briggs, whether it was strength finders, um, you know, emotional intelligence. But the main thing, frankly, my goal was not so, I did want to see and learn about the personalities and the, um, the, uh, the types within the law department, but I also wanted an easy and quick way for them to learn about me. Um, so I was very, very transparent. I joked about it a lot. I mean, you know, the, my, my empathy score was kind of bad. So, you know, I, I, and, I, and you know, people who know who work with me in the law department know I joke about that all the time. I hope that my empathy doesn't, it does, my empathy score does not actually reflect my actual way of behaving. Um, but that was really my goal was through doing those self-assessments with my team to really let them get to know me a little bit and to get to know me outside of the role that I was playing. You know, the hard part, I think, for me, and I think probably for all of you, is also getting feedback. You know, how do you, how do you, how does somebody come to you and tell you that, you know, maybe you're not doing what you should be doing, or maybe you're not using the right people, or whatever. So one of the things I also did was I, uh, I instituted a uh, um, office hours. So from 3 to 5 o'clock on Friday afternoons, anybody in the law department can come into my office. I, I have an open door policy, but I don't think people felt empowered to come. So this way, from 3 to 5 o'clock, anybody can walk into my office and talk to me about anything. And if they give me an idea that I implement, I give them a Starbucks $5 coffee card. Um, and I've given out a lot of Starbucks coffee cards, and it really, it really has been a great way to get feedback. So those are, so those are the kinds of things. But at the end of the day, my, my reaction is I want the best people I can find, and I want, them, I want to give them the room to do the jobs that, that they can do. And you know, if I just want to get out of the way to, to some extent, of course, you know, from a strategy point of view, from a, 
what do we need to, to, to think about or look at point of view, I'm always there. But, but really, having the people who have the talent and the skills that I can give room to do the job that they are capable of doing, I think that's my, my, my best skill as a leader in the law department. Hmm. Lauren, I, I actually want to switch just a little bit because one of the comments that Sandra made, if you can't change the people, change the people. For You're the most junior on this panel and you were probably in a position not so long ago where you were working under the people that you probably couldn't change. How did you deal with that in, in your career? And you don't have to call out the institution if it was. Did you have situations when you worked um, in a capacity where you were not leading that you had to deal with maybe people who were difficult and, and whether it's because you were a woman or anything, how did you deal with that? Um, I think for me, I, and yes, there are always throughout, if you go, particularly if you go through a number of different jobs, you're gonna encounter difficult bosses along the way. Um, that's just life. Um, I think the way I dealt with it uh, whether it was difficulties that were because it was a male who maybe didn't treat a female the same way, which didn't happen all that often, but happened occasionally. Or more frequently, it was just um, a difficult personality. You know, We've all had them, whether it's at law firms or any place else. They're just people who are difficult to work with. And uh, I think the way I've gotten through those situations has been to uh, you know, try and always have some way to relieve your stress outside of work. That's number one. Don't try and take it out at work. Um, make sure you have an outlet to sort of let off steam. And really try and be as flexible and as low key and don't let it get to you as much as possible. It's a lot easier said than done because there are times when you want to go home and you just literally want to scream you want to go into the ladies room and scream while you're at work but um, you know I think it goes along with the idea of being open-minded about your career and what opportunities lie ahead of you if you can just sort of go with it and not take things so seriously sometimes you can let things roll off your back that might otherwise <laughs> not and we talked a little bit about gender and the role that it plays um, in terms of your leadership and or maybe even addressing challenges <laughs> could you talk, maybe Andre will start with you because I think that you have some interesting stories to share um, from your experience and your leadership at MTV. Talk about what impact gender and cultural identity has played in terms of your leadership and how you overcame them personally or within your department. Uh, well, I think you're probably referring to the uh, our managing diversity uh, discussion that we had earlier. Um, I think uh, MTV Networks, I think, um, fancies itself justifiably as a pretty liberal, um, progressive company. I think we are. And champion diversity is something that um, is, a, is a top priority for us. But um, championing diversity and managing diversity are two very different things, which I um, learned um, myself um, close to probably 12 years ago. Um, it was right after 9-11, and uh, my team was emotionally spent, as I think many teams were. Um, and I think people were very distrustful of one another and of me in particular. I think people didn't know how, um, how they were being paid, meaning how salaries were constructed, how titles were given out, um, what their path to promotion was. And um, there was a lot of wariness and suspicion to the point where people just stopped talking to one another. Uh, and um, it became so tense that it was clear that if we didn't do something about it, it, we would just sort of implode and people would start, stop, start leaving. So we retained two sensational consultants. Uh, we went off-site across the street from our um, Times Square offices to a hotel conference room for two days where we holed up. And um, for what felt like forever, but was probably just a few minutes, nobody spoke. And the body language said it all. Everybody was really clenched and their arms were folded and their jaws were tight. And it was really, it felt like a very dangerous place. And then very slowly, very slowly, um, people started putting their issues out on the table. And we identified the proverbial 
elephants in the room. We even, the consultants even brought stuffed elephants that we all got, and I think all of us still have, um, that we would kind of physically clutch when we needed just comfort. Um, and we, truly, I still have mine. Uh, and every time we move offices, we move the elephant first, because the elephant has become a symbol of that time. And we transform what was a very scary, wary um, space, first to, I think, a neutral, non-judgmental place, um, and then finally to a safe place. And people's stories and emotions just came pouring out. Um, and the things that we told one another uh, were raw and were um, just honest and candid, and um, it was really just an incredibly transformative time for all of us. Uh, and we left there, I think, with a new commitment to one another that we could talk about difficult topics, that we would trust um, again and trust each other again, that we would give each other the benefit of the doubt, and that we would never again let ourselves get that deep into a hole. Um, and not one person left the company. Um, everyone went on to um, become senior managers running their own teams. Many people are here today in the front row. So that I say thank you. I love you guys. Um, and our story has become part of the legacy of the company. Just very, very. Um, maybe we can shift over here and talk a little bit um, about the role that gender and cultural identity has played on your leadership and, and your career. And Sandra, I know that you have some insights on Sheryl Sandberg, but also in, on your experience of being an Asian American woman um, in a legal department and growing in the legal department. Yeah, you know, um, we, we talked a little bit about um, cultural issues and how that affects your leadership style and your career choices. And, f and for me, I think I, want, I wanted to become an attorney because my parents are, were immigrants. And growing up, um, and I'm one of 10 children, I have nine sis eight sisters and one brother, um, we, uh, I really felt there was um, my parents and their friends and relatives were disadvantaged because they didn't understand the culture, the language, how to get certain things done. So that motivated me to be an attorney. Nonetheless, um, soon after I, I um, began working as an attorney, I realized there were certain cultural things with, with the way I grew up that put me at a, a disadvantage. Advantage. These are stereotypes, but generally stereotypes are based on some truth. As an, as an Asians in general, you know, you don't like to brag about yourself. That's considered bad form, and you're superstitious. Something bad will happen to you if you talk too much about yourself, right? <laughs> um, and, and, and we don't look people in the eye generally because that's disrespectful. Um, and we don't like to uh, say exactly what we want because that's bad form too. To be due to, to your, you'd be viewed as too demanding and pushy, and that's not good form either. Um, and you don't raise your voice you just to elders because that would be disrespectful as well. But I certainly learned quickly in the business world you have to do many of those things. It's important you look people in the eye because otherwise they think that you're not being uh, honest with them or you're hiding something, you know, being sneaky, a sneaky Asian, you know, so you have to really be very careful. <laughs> that stuff. Uh, and, and, yet, and you have to be able to talk about what you want because other people aren't mind readers and you would think that someone should know I'm working hard and I, I, I should be rewarded or recognized for my efforts, but people aren't mind readers and they know exactly what you want. And so it's important to articulate those things. So I think that you know, these are all painful lessons, but good lessons I think I learned along the way and also how to speak with confidence. I think Asians and I think even women in general too, we tend to be very apologetic for everything we do. We begin some of our questions, I'm sorry, but, and then you ask a question, like, what, why do we apologize so much, you know? And so that was another cultural thing I had to overcome and realize that I had a habit of always apologizing or saying something before I made a statement or gave an, an, or, or shared a viewpoint. So these are all sorts of things that you learn to overcome, I think, in time. But it's also very helpful to have someone, and there certainly have been some people along the way in my career, I wouldn't say mentors per se, but people who have said to me, well, why do you always, why are you so apologetic? You know, you have good things to say, but you always apologize before you say it. And I say, yeah, you're right, I do do that. You know, I have to stop that. So, you know, so you have to listen for those things, and it's helpful to have people who would give you frank advice throughout your career and your, about your style. Liz? Um, you know, people, people have often, you know, often asked me, so, you know, what affected you more, being a woman or being black? 
and I say I can't separate the two, so uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I would think sometimes it was a was a disadvantage, and sometimes it was an advantage. But it's not necessarily that I can always identify when it, which was which. Um, um, but but I do think that um, being uh, a black woman in the roles that I have had, whether it was as counsel to the governor, now at Con Edison, um, I I know that I I wind up talking to a lot of young black women professionals, and even at the firm. And, um, and I think having somebody that, that there aren't that many of us that black women can talk to. I didn't have a black woman to talk to when I was growing up in my career. So what I really try to do is make myself available you know, throughout my career. I, in, at the law firm, we had what was called Las Vegas Nights. What happens here stays here, and I would invite I would invite black women lawyers to, to dinner at my house or or to a restaurant and just for a couple of hours tell me you know tell me what's going on and the information flow often was not that great for them because there weren't a lot of people like them that that, that they could get that information from so it was it's always been part of my um, my DNA to to do that um, one quick story though. I became counsel to the governor, and I had a really big office, big conference table in the state capitol. It was really, you know, kind of cool. My first assistant counsel was a, a white guy, and you know, he was my first assistant counsel. My daughter came to visit one day. She was about five years old, and she says to me, "I'm afraid of Patrick." And I said, "Why?" He said, "Because I'm afraid he'll be mean to me." I said, "If he's mean to you, I will fire him." <laughs> so, so she goes into Patrick's office and says. Liz says that if you're mean to me, she'll fire you. And he said, yeah, she will. <laughs> and it, it was, it was mind-boggling to me that she assumed it, because he was a white guy, that I must work for him. Um, and you know, so, so that it's, really, it's really you know, ingrained, I think, in, a, in, in, in the society to think that way. But it was, it was a great opportunity for her. And I really, you know, look at it. we tell that story to this day. <laughs> And, and uh, Lauren, I, I keep saying that you know you're the youngest one on this panel, but uh, I'll <laughs> take pride in that. <laughs> um, can, do you, can you talk about the role that gender plays with you? I know we we had some stories about sort of being the the woman in the boardroom on the executive team, and yeah, I, you know I I feel fortunate in the sense that for the most part. Um, I consider myself to be part of a generation where I don't feel like being a woman has been an obstacle. I don't think I ever didn't get something because you know, I was a woman, we have more opportunities certainly than the generations before us. But there's still, you know, remnants around. We have a management committee of eight people and there are two women. I work at a cosmetics company that until two years ago was run entirely by men. Um, I mean, that's shocking to people, you know, and it's only within the last two years that they've added two women to the management committee, or, or two women came into positions that were part of the management committee. Um, and that, you know, as much as I do feel like a member of the team, it's still very, it's just a tangible sort of elephant in the room of us, to use that phrase, that you're in, particularly in a cosmetics company where, you know, it's predominantly men. Now, I, I say that just at the highest level. That's not true company-wide. It's, it's very different. Um, and you have to sort of get beyond that. You have to get beyond the fact that you're going to have, you know, whether it's uh, directors or just people involved in the company who are sort of older generation and don't necessarily, you know, they treat you more like a family member than they would a business executive. And that's, it's not because anyone's being intentional, it's just part of the generation. And it was, it's a very difficult thing because I, I tend to take things a little too personally and then you have to sort of step back and say, wait a second, this isn't a personal thing. It's just, it's just the way it is and you have to just sort of learn to deal with that. and just think, okay, hopefully 10 or 15 years from now, it's not going to be that way. So we'll see. In the nonprofit se sector, I know that there's a lot more women and in sort of your career path, but how, has, how have you seen that play out? Well, um, it, it, I started out uh, just a very, very few years in private practice and then went to um, uh, government and then into the nonprofit world where I've been ever since. And um, there are an awful lot of women in government and nonprofits. So when I look around, um, there were lots of women, not only in the legal department, I've had lots of women bosses. 
um, but also just in the leadership structure of the places that I've been including my current position where you know you talk about leaders it's not just leaders within your own department but you know leadership roles within your organization and so I've I've just been fortunate that um, have both men and women who've also uh, we talked about this word mentor but you know who have given me good advice over the years one thing I would note I, I, I note and I'm not sure I hate to generalize but I just in my experience in talking to women friends and colleagues and talking to male friends and colleagues I think sometimes it's the way we look at ourselves, um, and it was to something someone said down at the other end, like, you know, I'm sorry, but. I mean, I think there are things that we do to ourselves um, that I, I, my, our male colleagues just, I don't see them doing to themselves. The way we're very hard on ourselves, the way we, um, we doubt sometimes. Um, I don't know if anyone else has experienced this, but I talking to other women, you you doubt your qualifications to be where you are. Which, you know, if you talk to a guy, and I've talked to many, they think you're absolutely nuts because they have ne they just don't think like that. And where we do think like that. Um, and and so I think, you know. In addition to looking outward, I think we need to really look inward yeah. and make sure that we stop doing that to ourselves. And Andrew, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. We talked about the Sheryl Sandberg book, and I don't know how many of you have read Lean In, but um, you talked about how much of that resonated with you. Could you, and maybe not your experience personally, but sort of underlining it and reading it to your daughter or your, your well, kid. Well, I'm just curious, how many people have read all or parts of the book? Oh, God. <laughs> so I must admit, I came to the book reluctantly. Um, a colleague of mine highly recommended it, and I kind of shrugged it off, but I did, I did ultimately read it. And um, I, I was pleasantly surprised, and I do recommend it to everyone. Um, I actually gave a copy of it to my boss, who is um, currently male. And I stuck a note in saying, thank you for supporting women's leadership. Um, for, so for those of you who work with me, please let's encourage him to read it, because I'm not sure that he will. Um, and I also encourage people to give it to friends and, um, and relatives, and I think it will make a great Father's Day gift as well. Um, so I thought, just generally, I do want to say that I thought the tone was a little self-congratulatory, a little like, yay, I'm a new breed of feminist. You know, I need a gold star. But I thought there were a lot of really good um, points made. I want to read one thing, one very short thing, because this I actually loved and I did read it to my two girls. Um, uh, it said, find something you love doing and do it with gusto. Find the right career for you and go all the way to the top. Start out by aiming high, try and try hard. And I love that. Are there a lot of other things? Um, I also really love chapter four, which is about your career as a jungle gym, not a ladder. And I thought that was terrific. There are a lot of other good things, too. I won't go through all of them. But what I loved about that and that whole um, image and analogy was the idea that a jungle gym, um, you can go up and down and sideways, get on and off, and there are many ways to the top. And I thought that was really terrific, rather than a ladder, which is just up and down, and all you see is the person's butt right in front of you. <laughs> so I really, really like that. I, I, and, I, and one thing that struck me that Sandra said, and, and we'll, we'll get off the lean in for a little bit, but one thing that struck me that you said is that you didn't have a mentor or sponsor. And that's one thing that, for you who have read a Sheryl Sandberg book, she talks about stop searching for mentors and sponsors. I think um, mentors are highly overrated, and I think it might be controversial to say that, but there's, we're so focused on having a mentor or having a sponsor, and I look back in my career, and I can't identify a single person that I could say was my rabbi, was my mentor. I have certainly have worked with people along the way who uh, were, felt invested in my career and gave me good advice, but I, but I wouldn't say it was a quote-unquote mentor relationship. And I also think that I learned um, a lot about leadership and my leadership style by negative example. I've, had, I've met people and I've had bosses and I've said, when I become a boss, I will never be like that person. So you, know, so you, you have to, I think, learn being, uh, so you learn, uh, you know, it's more organic, I, I guess, than having an assigned mentor program because sometimes the chemistry is not right when you're assigned a mentor. I think rarely is it right and you have to, 
putting, stop putting so much pressure on yourself to find a mentor because you, these things develop, I think, naturally. And, and, and you should uh, you know, give yourself permission to relax a little bit and become very good at what you do. And so I had not read the Sheryl Sandberg book. I, I had, for some reason, I just don't want to read it. <laughs> I, I don't know why, but I read excerpts from it. But I do, but the quote that Andrew just, re Andrew just read resonates with me. You know, be, you have to find what you do, what you, you, what you enjoy. And you have to be very good at what you do. And I think people, once you are good at what you do, people will go to you, respect you for that, and work with you. You just can't expect people to come to you and say, let me be your mentor. You know, you have to contribute something to that relationship. When you talk about being good at what you do, maybe we could talk. How many of you are in-house here? Wow. How many of you are interested in going in-house? Government? Nonprofit sector? Law students? Oh, this is so great. What's your name? <laughs> <laughs> One. This is so exciting. My name is Stephanie Martin. Technically, I'm graduating next week, but I'm still concerned. Yay! <laughs> okay. Um, and thinking of your team and thinking of strong performers, um, is there anything that you could say, um, sort of what qualities have you seen and uh, your top performers um, that you admire the most, people that you admire the most, and if you're looking at this vast group of future leaders, um, what can they do to cultivate those skills and talents? Liz? Um, be willing to take on challenges. I love people that work for me who just take on a challenge. It's not, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a volunteering for it, not even my, oh, I need somebody to do this. It's the person who walks into my office and says, oh, you know something, there's this challenge over here, there's this problem over here, I'm gonna take care of it. Um, I love that. I love people who are willing to pursue different kinds of opportunities. You know, there's a position in the gas department, I'd like to try out for it. Um, but you're a lawyer, but that's okay. But yeah, uh, yeah, I'm a lawyer, but I really want to. I want to try this. Um, so being open to opportunities, being open to challenges, and as everybody has said here, being willing to do the best job that you possibly can to show what you can do, and be. And I think women, in particular, you know, need to really put themselves out there. Um, the guys do it. I mean, I hate to say it. I don't want to be. You know, and I know many of you do. But the guys, you know, they they. They'll step out and they will push and they will insert themselves into things that aren't even in their areas necessarily. Um, I think, not that this just applies in-house because I think it also applies anywhere you are, but in particular in-house, um, I think two very critical things to succeed uh, are the ability to both communicate and to listen well. It's particularly what I've really come to appreciate when you're in-house so much, you know, you have to establish yourself as the person who all the business people, whatever your area is, whether it's you're dealing with finance people, marketing people, sales people, you want them to come talk to you. You want them to come seek your advice. And the people who really succeed are, in addition to being smart and getting all the work done, are the people who can communicate well with people who aren't lawyers and who listen. Um, we as lawyers often tend to communicate in our sort of own bizarre language and way of speaking, and that's just not the way that most of the world communicates. And I see people every day run into trouble because they're great, smart lawyers, but they're just, they're like this when they're talking to someone on the business side. One can't understand the other, and it's being able to communicate on a level that they understand you without you and this is the trick to it, without you sounding like you're talking down to them, because they can get you know, a little touchy about that if they think the lawyer is trying to talk down to them. They don't think they're, we're, that they're as good as, as we are. Um, and that's a, a real skill, to be able to communicate well. And once you can communicate well, and you listen to them, and they're listening to you, you're going to have a much more successful relationship. And thinking about. Um your roles and stepping back to you a little bit how do you stay and maybe we'll start with Andre here um, how do you stay um, creative and innovative in what you do um, and how do you do it when there's so many people for all of you vying for your time whether it's business people the teams that you manage and 
think that you're you're managing 50 people and Sandra you're 100 how many do you have uh, list in the entire law department yes or just lawyers L uh, entire law department uh, 200 and 200 yeah. we'll change yeah. how do you how do you uh, kind of stay creative and innovative while you're and proactive versus being reactive well I think you have to first of all be exceedingly organized and not just in terms of knowing where things are and making lists and all that but a very very organized thinker um, and because you have to have everything under control before I think you can be really creative and get to the fun stuff um, so you have to know how to delegate you have to know how to prioritize and just basically get your work done um, and have great people around you and I do um, I think then you have to constantly be reinventing yourself. I think one thing um, that women suffer from probably more than men is being labeled. So we're labeled first, we're the single woman, then we're the newly married woman, maybe we're a single mom. Then we have one kid, oh my God, is she gonna have another kid? Is she gonna leave us? Once she has two kids, I've heard, oh my, you know, there's a theory, once you have two kids, you're not coming back. Um, then you have a full house and you can't take on a big project. Then you have grown kids and maybe you can take on more projects. And so you're constantly being put into boxes. So so I think it's really important to try and kind of defy that and reinvent yourself, right, and be known for something other than your relationship to your marital or your childbearing status. Um, so it's, you know, it's about being known for, um, for other things, becoming expert at something, becoming the go-to person, becoming indispensable, because if you're indispensable, they can't fire you. So um, that's kind of... That's interesting, that the idea of not being known for having kids. I think that, Sandra, you talked about that and how that could get women in trouble sometimes talking about their kids. Well, I, you know, I don't mean to be critical, but there are, I think we've all been at meetings sometimes and we're very supportive. I'm a, you know, I was a work, working mother. My kids are, 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 are grown now, but there was a time when they were, they were small and I was working. And, and I think we've all had experience where we had people in our teams who talked about their kids constantly. And, and when you talk about the kids constantly, sometimes out of context at a meeting, it, it, people start, right, whether it's fair or not, they start thinking, is she really focused on her work? She's always talking about her kids. She wears her kids on her sleeve or something like that. And it's not to say you can't talk about children, are obviously a very important part of our lives. But I think there's a time and a place to talk about your children and their many accomplishments, but if you're in a business meeting and you begin the business meeting with 20 minutes about what you know Susie did last night that was so cute at the kitchen table, <laughs> it's probably not appropriate. And, and, and then you wonder why people may not take you as seriously as you would like them to. So again, I don't mean to sound critical of women because we all love our kids and are excited about all the various accomplishments and the cute things they do, but there's a time and place for everything. And I think we have to censor ourselves sometimes. Uh, and, and again, it's it's not to say you can never talk about your kids, but there's a time and a place. I just want you to know I'm in trouble because I'm about to be a grandmother in about a month, and that's <laughs> all I talk about. <laughs> so I, you know, <laughs> every meeting, you know, it's an update on <laughs> my, my excursions to Bye Bye Baby, and, you know. It's a, so funny. I, I, I think we got a little off topic. And, and you know, and there's, gonna, there's a great story that we could have Andra share right now that she shared, but I think we'll really go off topic. But we will get to that story. Um, Sandra, in terms of how you prioritize, I mean, your department just won best, yeah. you know, legal department of the year. You're doing something really right to, to get that I, honor. I make sure that I surround myself with people who are a lot smarter and savvier than I am. <laughs> I mean, that's what it is. When I used to run, I always ran with people who ran were better runners than me, and that improved my game. And so that's what uh, I try to do with my legal team. I, I, I make sure that we have very good communication in the group. We have <coughs> weekly calls with the entire team. We have monthly in-person meetings. So having that constant communication with, with the members of your senior leadership team, I think is very important. And, and especially when someone's new to the team, I meet with that person even more often so they get a sense of the rhythm and pace and what I need to, to, to know about. So I think that's the key. It's good communication, knowing what's going on, and making it clear to your team, too, that you're the type of person that's approachable. There's no such thing as a silly question, and that's what I tell my team all the time, no such thing. Um, and you have to have an, an open door. And I always tell my people the rule is I never want to be embarrassed if my boss asks me a question that I don't know the answer to. Uh, you know, that's rule number, don't, don't, don't embarrass. I don't want to be embarrassed. So, and so people have a good sense of what's important. And in our line of work, we're a publicly held company. If there's something going on that could affect earnings, 
I want to know about it early to make sure we've done the proper accounting and we've done and looked at all any potential legal issues. So that's something. So there's certain things I prioritize. And we have some young people who are um, in-house, and one of the things that struck me in talking with Andra, maybe you could talk about your bartering system, Andra, really quick, in terms of uh, staying innovative and in terms of technology. Oh, my technology? Well, um, I am a Luddite, and um, I never learned how to type. It's one of my few regrets in life. I type with two fingers. Um, my oh children my have given... Huh? <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah, it was, it, it was beneath me. I was such an idiot. And my children have given up on me. They will not help me. Um, my fabulous executive assistant, Imani, who is here today, um, has much greater patience. And so I, I rely on youth. I rely on young people to teach me. I'm in awe of technology, and I try to do things better and faster. Um, slowly, I'm getting used to it when I'm not kicking my printer. Um, but I find that technology, as many of us know and, and have accepted, is a, is a fabulous thing and can help us get our jobs done better and faster and give us more time to be creative and get to the fun part of, parts of our job. So you barter with them, you teach I barter them with them. Something. I say, you come help me fix my printer and show me how to cut and paste for the 17th time because I've forgotten <laughs> how to do it, and I will teach you something about my job, and you can shadow me. And that's our barter system, right? right? Reverse mentoring. Try it. Um, Liz, you made a statement um, during a call that uh, kind of got to this when you talked about delegating and how great you are at um, scheduling, but relying on talented people to make you look good. You made a statement about the legal profession and jobs and people taking it seriously. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I, well, I think what I said was something like, um, I, I hate when lawyers view being a lawyer as a job and not a profession. And one of the things I talk about in the law department is when I was in a law firm, my clients could fire me. They could walk. They could find another law firm. You know, in-house, my clients can't walk, but I think we should treat our, our in-house clients the way you know, law firms treat their, their clients. Um, you know, and I look for feedback from our clients. I want to make sure, you know, we do client surveys, I call people. I really want to make sure that we are a team and that we're trying, we are helping our clients achieve our strategic and business objectives. And that means, you know, going the extra yard, you know, being there and, and fixing the problem or addressing the problem, no matter how long it takes, no matter whether, you know, you're working, you know, around the clock to get it done. You know, we're at Con Edison, so we have things like storms, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and all of the issues that can come out, you know, come out of that kind of, of thing. You know, the people in the operations units are working around the clock. We work around the clock. We have a, you know, we have a lot of things to do. Um, you know, one of my lawyers is here, Caroline. She was, uh, she's a, my purchasing lawyer. So, you know, when you have a storm, guess what? You're doing a lot of quick contracts, a lot of emergency contracts for a lot of things. And, um, and you know, she, we work around the clock. So I think that's what I meant when I said, you know, this is, this is not the kind of job where I expect people to work 8.30 to 5.30 and, you know, go home and put their Blackberries or their iPhones away and, you know, not look at it again until the, the morning. I'm respectful of people's time. I'm respectful of people's, um, of weekends and things like that. But if I need something, if the company needs something, if my clients need something, you know, I expect our, my lawyers to address it. The other thing I look for is, is natural curiosity. I think, you know, the, 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 the lawyers, as I said, the lawyers who really look for things, look for problems to address, you know, and address them, who see beyond what's been presented to them. You know, a lot of this is like chess. You, know, you can make one move, but guess what? There's five things under that that you need to look at, too. And so having natural curiosity, I think, is a real, you know, great attribute to have as a lawyer. So that's all part to me of not being, it's not just a job, it is a profession. And if you do it well, that's how I think you should view it. In, in terms of motivating your staff, I, and, and Petrina, I think that you could discuss this. When you're in a nonprofit sector, and probably the government as well, I think that they are, that's like a prime example of motivation. People are there for a cause. Um, they are, I mean, Look, in looking at her company institution, they service 29,000 individuals in 175 countries, and there are a staff of 15, is that right? Well, which staff? Uh, the, the, the leadership legal? staff, okay. Or how, how big is your legal department, or just the institution as a whole? 
I'm looking at I'm looking at one of I'm looking at one of my two lawyers over there, which is why I'm in awe when I hear someone's got a staff of 200. I don't even I can't even imagine what that's like. Um, so there are three of us lawyers trying to keep everything together. At, the institute is about 650 um, employees, okay. but as I said, I mean I come from a nonprofit background. Before I was here, I was at NYU. Um, I, for me, I mean, part of the reason I went to the government and then to nonprofit is because I, I'm just one of those people where I just need to feel connected to what I'm doing. Um, you know, my friends used to joke, my husband used to joke that we were very downwardly mobile when I first <laughs> started out because I went from a law firm. <laughs> Every job I took, I cut my salary. Um, and believe me, it wasn't because I was like independently wealthy or anything, um, working class <laughs> background. Um, but I just really feel felt like I, I, that's just the way I operate. I really just need to be connected to the to what I do. And a lot of people that I'm around feel the same way. Whether it was in my legal departments or at IIE, and I'm looking at Robbie. I mean, I, I, the people there are just very dedicated, inside and outside of our, the legal function and work incredibly hard um, because they're committed to the mission. Um, and, you know, it's the sa it was the same when I was in a university, you know, in a different way, but um, people are very committed to what they do and they put in the hours and uh, the passion, not necessarily because they're gonna get a big paycheck, Lord knows, right, <laughs> or a big bonus at the end of the year, but because they really believe in, um, in, what, in what they're doing, what the organization is, is doing, and they want to be part of, um, you know, a bigger, uh, something bigger, so. So I think that, how much time do we have, Bernadette? Because we want to take five minutes, okay. So I, I do want to ask a question. We talked about kids and balance. Um, we talked about not talking about your kids um, as much at work, but we also didn't talk a, a lot about, you know, kind of how you balance work with other priorities and how you get over this Sheryl Sandberg thing. She talks about the guilt of um, being balancing work and family and an outside life and not, all, not everyone up here has kids. How, how, anyone want to take a stab at that and, and how you do it? I just want to say, I think work-life balance, people talk about it too much, and we beat ourselves up too much over trying to achieve it. It doesn't exist. I mean, it, 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 in the sense that you will always make choices in your life. You're going to choose to do some things and, 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 and not others, and, and we have to stop feeling guilty about the choices we make. I think the key thing is to be on the same page as your partner, your spouse, or whatever, and have an agreement on that. Um, you know, I've certainly missed my share of my kids' games. They're, they're now 21 and 23. They're none of, neither of them are under the, are getting psychiatric review or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're, they're fine. They're well-adjusted young men. And I think they're, and part of that was because they knew that their mom was happy working. And by my working, um, that gave them a, a good environment. And I was also able to buy them all those electronic gadgets they really, the kids really <laughs> like. So, you know, so I think that we just make choices. Stop beating ourselves up and you, ha you don't have to, no one is perfect and we shouldn't try to be perfect. And you have to give yourself permission to do the best you can, but take it easy on yourself and, and reward yourself too. And, and, and just basically give yourself permission to not be perfect. You know, if I could add, I mean, I, when I had, I have uh, two kids, um, one's 22 and one is soon to be 16. When, when I first had my children, I, the big divide was between women who worked after they had the kids and women who didn't work. Okay, that was really, I felt like the big divide. The women who went to work felt guilty because they went to work and they were watching their friends who didn't go to work. And the women who didn't go to work felt guilty because they had educations and they were home and looking at the, the people who went to work. I think the, the thing that you need to do is to do what feels right for you and stop worrying about what yeah, I stopped reading everything about, you know, what harm I was doing to my children or not by, by going to work. I mean, the bottom line is I think kids 
they know, they don't know anything else. See, you know something else, and so you're thinking, oh, I'm, am I hurting them? Am I not hurting them? That child only knows the experience that that child is having, and they're going to be fine. They really are. I mean, I, I agree. At the end of the day, they're going to be fine. Again, my I worked since my kids were born, and they seem relatively well adjusted. <laughs> they may be on a couch later in life. I'm sure it'll be my fault, but you know that's going to happen regardless. But I really think <clears throat> you've got to do what feels right to you. And don't you know? I've seen lots of women pressured by their family, by their mothers, <laughs> by their you know to either work or not to work. Do what feels right to you. I mean, that's what I think you really need to do. Um, I, th I think we're running out of time, but I do want to, I think that we, we talked about being on the speaker circuit about diversity, and I think that Liz and Sandra talked about sharing a panel on this, and, and Lauren um, made the statement that 20 years ago, if she would have been talking about the fact that there's not a lot of women partners at a law firm, and it would be the same percentage, she would never have believed it. If we're talking 10, 20 years from now with respect to women and advancing in the workplace, what do you hope that conversation will entail? And uh, who, who, wants to, who wants to take a step? I'm going to defer to Liz. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> no, I, I do think the world will be a different place if for no other reason 50% of, you know, more than the majority of law students graduating from law schools are women. Um, they are getting into that pipeline in law firms and certainly in-house. I think law firms are going to realize that their model is broken because I'm hiring terrific women from law firms. And why would you want to lose those women if you're a law firm, if they are so good? And the reason they're losing them is because the model that they're using is, is not working for a lot of women. And going in-house, in some cases, is a, is a more predictable lifestyle. So I think law firms are going to have to look at that, and I think the legal profession as a whole is going to look at that. And I'm, I'm, I'm fairly optimistic that, that women are going to change the legal profession and simply for no other reason than, you know, we have the numbers now, so things will have to be addressed. And I think law firms are aware of that. Any, any other thoughts? I think it would be great if 10 or 20 years from now we didn't have to really focus on, you know, what our, our special experiences as women were, and we can sit around and talk in a room that had both men and women about what it's like to practice law or be a leader or because I think a lot of these things cut across gender. They, they do. And so maybe one day we will reach that point. Am I opening up for questions now? No questions? Three questions. <laughs> really. <laughs> Pretty dead so. Choose wise. I really, I really don't know. I'm sure there's, there must be a study done on that. I just don't know what the stats say. I don't know. Does any? I'm not. I, I think that for women of color, that that is, that's a huge issue. That yeah. they find that women of color are leaving, particularly law firms, but leaving the law at more alarming rates. I think that now there's just so many opportunities for women with a law degree and internally within law firms, people are, are staying a little bit longer, um, maybe not making partner, but it's certainly staying a lot longer. Um, but for women of color, that's a, it's a huge alarming issue. Over here. Well, for, for me, it was really learning to delegate and let go. And, and, and so I think that especially as women, we like to do everything and get our hands, we're, we're very good at doing things. And so taking a step back from relying on others and picking, identifying key talent you could rely on, I think was the, was the toughest thing. That's, I think that's absolutely right. When I was in Albany, um, basically the, all the lawyers in all of the state agencies were my law firm. 
So I had to know who in the tax department could give me the answer to that tax question, and and and, and you know, a identify that person, and then secondly, know when to ask the question and what the question, the right question was, because I clearly couldn't learn tax, environmental, you know, housing, you know, you name it. Don't spend beyond your means. Always save money. I, we never moved to the big house. We've been in the same house for over 20 something years, and I'm glad we did <laughs> because it does. I, I, you, you hear of colleagues all the time trading up and borrowing money and just, you know, spending beyond their means. I think you always have to have a good view of, you know, saving because you never know what might happen in the future. Maybe that's my insecurity, but this is here today, it could be gone tomorrow. So <laughs> always, always save. I say two things. One is take care of your finances, learn about it, understand it, understand how to invest and what you're investing in, and take care of your body. You know, yeah. you know, you're, you don't. You, it's not a car. You can't replace the parts. Wow. So you need to get those physicals, get those you know screenings, get some exercise. You know, take care of yourself. Eat, eat halfway decently sometimes. <laughs> take care of yourself. Well. She's going to work out after this, so that's really <laughs> inspiring for all of us. So one of the things that I um, said that I really hope that we learn today is what is important for a leader to know, what values are important for a leader to have, and what skill sets are important for a leader to possess. So one of the things that I've been doing is feverishly taking notes here, and I'm just going to talk about values and end on here. Um, integrity and a sense of ethics. Um, Passionate, transparency, respect, openness, collaboration, open communication, being organized, managing people, and of course, I want to end with, which will be my motto, is treat your, this job like a profession not like a job. So with all of that, I hope that you will take these um, words of wisdom and apply them in your lives as you climb, not the ladder, or the jungle gym to success. I just and want to I, thank the panelists tonight, including and I, Zakia. I want to thank them as well. While Zakia is organizing that, please look on the back of your seats if you see a purple ribbon. There are 15 of them, and you can go collect your book at the back. You have to take the ribbon off the seat and turn it in. Now, there's also, a, there's also at that desk a membership for the New York City Bar, a discount, and I think the fee is waived. So um, please see and join for membership. Okay, and uh, Zakia may have one more thing. Thank you all no, for coming. I don't have anything. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. One more round of applause. Oh, okay.